Watch and share in a moment. Just one message we're going to sing this morning, Knowing You. Uh, it's a beautiful song we've sung a couple times here. The words will be on the screen this morning. series last week uh, entitled Christmas from Heaven's Perspective. And as a pastor, December is a very difficult month for me. Uh, if you've ever been in church any length of time, uh, you've probably heard countless Christmas messages on the Christmas story. And in the Bible, there's only two places, two chapters in the New Testament that deal with the details of the birth of Christ. And of course, they are Matthew chapter 2. And Luke chapter number two. And if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard messages from these two chapters. This is our fifth Christmas together. And this is the first Christmas that I'm not preaching through these two chapters and looking at the, the perspective of heaven from the people that were in these passages. In these passages, we see the stories of, of course, uh, Mary and Joseph. And we can kind of see what Christmas looked like uh, for them that first Christmas day. Uh, we, we see the, the shepherds, we see the wise men, we, we even see the innkeeper and how these people uh, pictured and how they viewed and what their opinion of was of that first Christmas. And their view of Christmas is different than our view of Christmas. Today, especially in America, Christmas has become very commercialized. Now, I know a lot of us and most of us here, we, we enjoy the, the traditions. Uh, we like getting together with friends and family. We, we like having the big meals together. We, we enjoy the gift getting and the gift giving. We like trying to get that special someone some gift that they wanted or hoped for or kind of they, they, they really aren't expecting. And we enjoy the whole gift getting and gift giving process. And, you know, even, you know, businesses uh, nowadays, 
they have commercialized Christmas so much. You know, that's why Black Friday is the biggest Christmas Day shopping of the year. It's the day that most businesses get into black uh, by their numbers. They make their numbers for that year. And so they love Christmas. They'll, they'll use Santa Claus. Uh, they'll use anything they can. They'll even use Jesus if it'll get you in the store to buy more presents. And so Christmas has become drastically different in our century, in our time, than it was even in that first Christmas. And even, you know, especially in America, we've really kind of gotten away from it. Even most of us Christians, we, you know, my, I know in my family, I know most of you do as well. You, you really, you, you try to keep Christ in Christmas. We talk to all the Christmas story. We read it to our kids. We explain that Christmas isn't your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday, and we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. And we really try to keep the focus on Christ. But it, it still is hard. It still, he kind of gets lost in all the stuff that we do. And so I want this year for us to look at Christmas, not from our viewpoint, not from the viewpoint of the characters in the Christmas story, but let's see what heaven thinks about Christmas, especially that first Christmas. Over 2,000 years ago when God became flesh and was born in a manger so long ago. And so, there, there, but there are countless passages besides Luke and Matthew that tell us about Christmas, that give us details into Christ and his birth, why he came, who he really was, and what he offers to us as he came. And the first chapter in the book of Colossians is one of these passages of Scripture. They give us some incredible insight into that first Christmas, why Christmas had to be, why Jesus had to come, and, and what the purpose of it really was, not from our viewpoint, not from Mary's viewpoint or Joseph's viewpoint, but from the viewpoint and the perspective of of heaven. So last week we began looking at it, and we answered the question of why Jesus came. And if you weren't here, uh, you weren't here to hear that message, you can catch up on our podcast. We do have a podcast, and I don't announce that a lot, and God keeps telling me we've got to announce that. We have a podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast and get it every every Tuesday it goes live, so you can get, a, get the podcast and listen to why Jesus came. And uh, we saw that he came for four specific reasons. He came to qualify us. He came to claim us. He came to rescue us and he came to redeem us. We boiled it down to this one simple truth. Jesus came for you. Now when we look at that on a worldwide kind of perspective, it's a powerful truth. Amen. God came for mankind. But the truth that we sometimes over, overlook, you know, we say, well, God so loved the world, the world needs everyone in the world. That's true. Biblically speaking, doctrinally speaking, God came for the entire world. But the truth is, if you were the only one that needed saving, Jesus would have come for you. He loves you that much. He loves me that much that God came for us. And then the next section of Scripture in Colossians chapter 1, Paul starts dealing with the question of who Jesus is. So we're going to read Colossians 1. We're going to read verse 15 through verse 19 this morning. Then we'll jump to our message simply entitled, Who Jesus Is. Let's read this morning. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get our message this morning simply entitled, Who Jesus Is. Heavenly Father, thank you for that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege we have today to gather together and to worship you, God. Lord, we do thank you so much for uh, this wonderful holiday season. God, we do enjoy all the, the traditions and getting together with family, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we, we thank you for that. But, God, more than that, we thank you that, Lord, you did come. And, then, Lord, you came for us. Now, God, as we look at the scripture this morning and we answer the question of, of who you are, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit down, Lord, to talk to us. I pray, Lord, that you would move to each and every chair. I pray that you would touch each and every heart, that you would do a work in every life gathered this morning. Lord, I pray that for those of us who are saved, who are Christians, God, Lord, we know you as our Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith. I pray, God, that you would encourage us, that, 
Lord, you would, would lift our burdens, God. I know there's a lot of heavy hearts here. I pray that you would uh, encourage us, God, and strengthen us. But Lord, also know, Lord, that there's probably a couple people here who, Lord, they're not saved. They don't know you as their Savior. I pray, God, that you would convict their hearts this morning. I pray, God, that you would help them to understand, Lord, that they are lost. And, God, God, that they do need a Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would use the preaching of your word to draw them to you. And help them, Lord, to be saved today before it's forever and eternally too late. I pray, God, you would speak through me. I pray, God, you would help me to say what needs to be said, what should be said. And God, help me not to say what I should not say. But God, help everything that's said and done bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, as we answer the question of who Jesus is, we're going to answer that question by asking a couple other questions and trying to answer them as we go along. The first question we're going to ask is, who do people say Jesus is? Now, I'm not talking about today. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But in Jesus' day, in the first century, who did people say Jesus was? There were a lot of different opinions by a lot of different people about who this person, Jesus Christ, actually was. Uh, throughout his ministry, he went by many different names. Many of his enemies, they viewed him as a rebel. They viewed him as someone who was trying to overthrow the Roman government. They, they saw him as almost a community organizer, someone who, who needed to be stopped. Many of his followers, they followed him, they listened to his teachings, they liked what he said, but they didn't view him as the Messiah. They didn't view him as the Savior. They thought of him as a prophet, a teacher, a good man who was ushering in the Messiah, who was, who was kind of proclaiming who Jesus, who the Messiah will be one day. We see, at least, let's see from the Bible, who people in the Bible days and in Jesus' day, who they said he was. In Matthew chapter 1, we see the story of Gabriel coming to Joseph. And of course, you know the story. Mary, of course, is, is with child of a virgin. She goes to her fiancé, Joseph, and says, Hey, uh, Joseph, uh, you know, I've got some good news for you. I'm expecting a child, and you're not the father. There is no earthly father. God is the father. And Joseph, uh, he had his doubts. He, he loved Mary, but he thought, Yeah, you're, you're the virgin spoken about in Isaiah. Sure, whatever, Mary. Uh, I understand. And he loved her. He could have had her stoned, but he didn't. He said, I'm going I'm to put her away privately and kind of just, just kind of secretly get rid of this thing and take care of it and, and just take care of it quietly. But Gabriel comes to him in a dream and speaks to him. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, Gabriel says, Joseph said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. So Gabriel told Joseph, said, Hey, he has a name, his name is Jesus, but he's not just this kid named Jesus, he's the Savior. So he went by the name of the Savior in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, in, 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 G, in Isaiah's day. They called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We, we see that later on in the book of Matthew as well, where, G, where G, the angel says, hey, he is Jesus. He is God with us. He is God in the flesh. When the Magi came, in the story of the Magi, they saw the star in the east, and these were well-educated men, and they knew that a new star appearing was a, was a, a miraculous event, and it had to mean something. So they, they studied the scriptures, they studied all the the, the text that they had, the, uh, and somehow they had a copy of the Old Testament Bible, and they were studying that, and they found out, man, this, this star, it means that there's a birth of a new king. And so they go to Herod because they knew that it meant the, the king of the Jews, and he was the king over the Jews at that time. So they, they go to Herod to say, hey, we want to see your new son. And they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? So the wise men, they, they saw him as the king that was going to rule the Jewish people. Later on in his life, he comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And John the Baptist sees him for the first time uh, coming down. And he, he recognizes him for who he is. And he goes, hey, behold, the Lamb of God who, who taketh away the sin of the world. He recognized him as the Lamb of God. In Matthew chapter 19, we see the story of a rich young ruler who comes to see Jesus. And when he, when he sees him, he goes up to him and says, hey, uh, good master, which and literally translated means good teacher. He didn't see him as the Messiah. He didn't see him as his Redeemer. He saw him as a teacher. A good teacher, yes, but just a teacher. Then some of them, they called him a prophet. And then, of course, after the Pharisees, after they met with him and talked with him and conversed about him, they said, we know who he is. He's Beelzebub. He said, he's just Satan. He's Satan in the flesh. What about the disciples? 
What did the disciples think about who he was on the Sea of Galilee? They, they had that ter terrible storm and they're all scared and here comes Jesus. They wake him up and say, Don't you con aren't you concerned we're going to perish? Aren't you concerned we're going to die? We're about to die out here. We're bailing water off the edge of the ship and you're just taking a nap. Aren't you worried about us at all? And Jesus, of course, you know the story, he gets up and he looks at the sea. He looks at the rain. He looks at the wind and says, Would y'all be quiet? I'm trying to take a nap. And everything just goes dead silent. And they even ask the question, Who is this guy? And even the winds and the waves obey him. Who is he? At Caesarea Philippi, Jesus gathered his disciples together and says, Hey guys, who do, who do, who do people say I am? You know, y'all have been talking to the people. Y'all have seen the crowds. Y'all kind of intermingling in the crowds. And, and y'all know what's going on. Who do people think I am? And they said, man, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people, they think you're Elijah. Other people say you're probably Jeremiah or some other prophet from the Old Testament who was reincarnated to prepare the way of the Messiah. And he said, well, those are all pretty bad guesses. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, without hesitation, he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter had it right. Even at his trials, even at his trial, there were questions about who he was, about his identity. Uh, of course, Pilate comes to him and says, are, and asked him, says, are you the king of the Jews? They say you claim to be the king of the Jews. Are you what they claim to be? You know, when Thomas, after his death and after his resurrection, Thomas, of course, he wasn't there in the first meeting. And so they all tell him, say, hey, man, Jesus, you missed a great prayer meeting last night. Jesus showed up and he preached. He was incredible, man. And Thomas says, I don't believe it. I'm not going to believe it until I can thrust my hand in the side and poke my, my finger in the holes in his hands. I won't believe that he's back. Well, Thomas was there the next time. Jesus showed up, and Jesus comes and says, Hey, Thomas, go ahead and put your finger through there. Go ahead and put your... Feel me and, and see that I am who I... That I am back. And Thomas looked at him and says, You are my Lord and my God. There are a lot of different opinions in the first century, even by his followers, about who... Jesus exactly was. The same is true today. Today, there's a lot of opinions about who Jesus is. Go to the mall. Just to start asking people, who is Jesus? You'll get a lot of answers. Some people, some atheists, they may say, well, he's a fictional character created by the Christians to kind of instill their religion on everybody, and he never really existed. He's, just, he's a fable that a bunch of old people made up thousands of years ago, and it's kind of taken on the form now where it's, it's, it's formed the Christian religion today, but he never really existed. Now, that is contrary to what history teaches us. Take the Bible out. I'm not talking about Scripture references. If we look at historical texts from the day, there is more evidence... That a man named Jesus lived than there is that anybody else lived for the last 2,000 years. He is a historically proven individual. History tells us Jesus lived and walked on the earth. It tells about his, his ministry. It tells about his death on the cross. There is historical evidence that Jesus Christ lived. But you may come across someone who says, well, he, did, he never really existed He's just a fictional character. Maybe you'll come across somebody else who goes, oh yeah, Jesus existed. There's no doubt about that. But he, he was just a good man. He was just a prophet. He was just a teacher. You know, he's not God in the flesh. He's just, he, he teaches us how to live. Uh, the other night, me and April, we were out and we were doing some shopping. We stopped to get a bite to eat. And uh, as we were eating, there was a table uh, right next to us. And it was just a, a bunch of young people. Uh, together, it kind of kind of broke my heart. I wish I, you know, wish I would talk to them, but they're sitting there talking, and I, I kind of, me and April were talking, but my ears perked up because one of them, he, I heard the word Baptist Church. I thought, like, oh, what are they talking about? Who are they bashing? I want to get gossip here. But anyway, I said, there, listen, and this one guy, he's talking. He goes, oh yeah, the last week I went to a, this, I don't remember, he goes, oh, this Baptist Church. And he was talking, oh, I enjoyed it. It was good. You yeah, had a good time, and I really enjoyed the pastor and whatnot. And so, you know, I figured he must come here, but. Uh, <laughs> But they were, and they started talking about religion. This one guy, he says, you know, when I grew up Episcopalian, because I know all what the Bible teaches, I know what Jesus says, and he goes, and I, I believe that Jesus existed, but I, I don't believe that he's God. I just believe he teaches us morals. He teaches us how to live. Well, if you have that viewpoint, then you, you downplay who Christ 
actually was. And uh, they, they downplay who he really was. They, they discount his true identity. You might come across someone who says, oh yeah, I believe Jesus is, is existed. I believe he's even God. I believe he is one of the ways to get to God. There's an opinion that God is like a mountain. There's many paths to the mountain. Jesus, he's, he's a good man. He's a good teacher. He's a good path. You can take the Jesus path to get to God. But that takes away what he said when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, hey, I'm one of the ways. He didn't say, I'm the Jesus path, and there's the Muhammad path, and there, there's the Buddha path, and there's, a, there's the, 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 the tree-hugging path, and there's, the, there's all these paths. He goes, no, I'm the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody's going to come to God unless they go through me. Hopefully, though, you'd come across, across a Christian who could give you the correct answer about who Jesus is. Ask me, who is Jesus to you? And I'll tell you, he's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He's the one who pulled me out of the miry clay and set my feet on the rock. He's the Creator. He's the God. He's my sustainer. He is the lover of my soul. He is everything to me. And hopefully, you would get someone who would give the correct answer. So that answers the question, who do, who do people say Jesus is? The answer is simple. There's a lot of different opinions about who Jesus is. But that doesn't really matter. The question that matters is, who <coughs> does God say Jesus is? doesn't matter what the Pharisees thought doesn't matter what John the Baptist thought. doesn't matter what the atheist crowd thinks. doesn't matter what the, the uh, ecumenical movement thinks. doesn't matter what I think about who Jesus is. The only opinion that matters is God's. Who does God say Jesus is? And we, we get the answer. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God gave Paul the answer in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to go through verse by verse, chapter 15 through 19. We're going to see who God said Jesus was. The first thing we see that God says Jesus is, is he is the image of the invisible God. Look again at verse 15. It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? What does that mean? Now, the Bible tells us very clearly no man has seen God. You haven't seen God. I haven't seen God. I don't care how bad the burrito was you ate before you went to bed to a God in the morning and had that drink. You didn't see God. No man has seen God. Moses didn't even get to see God. He got to see the hinder parts of God, but he didn't get to see God. And then we have Jesus, God in the flesh. And God says, when you see Christ, you're seeing me. He is the image of who God is. He is the exact impression of the real substance of God. The holy God, the precious God that no man could see and live. God said, I gave you Jesus and when you see him, you're looking at me. Amen. You're seeing the image of the one that you couldn't see. God allowed man to see a physical representation of him when Jesus Christ came to earth. The invisible God pressed himself into the clay of humanity so that God in the flesh could show us how God would live. When we see Christ and we see his character, we see his love, we see his mercy, we see what it looks like for God to walk among man. Because everything he did, he did as God. He is the image of God for us. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the character of God lived out. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 9, He goes, He that has seen the Father has seen me. Jesus is the portrait of God so that when you see the personal, so that we can look at the Bible and we can see Christ and we can see his life and we can say those are the personal characteristics of God. That is what it looks like for God the Father to live on earth. Bob Russell, he's a pastor of Southeast Baptist Church. He said this. He said, you can look at nature and it will tell you all about the existence and the power of God. But nature doesn't reveal fully the essence and the personality of God. It is only in Jesus that we see perfectly God's compassion, God's forgiveness, God's grace, and God's patience lived out. When we see Christ, we don't see a teacher. We don't see a good man. We don't see someone who tells us kind of some lessons God wants us to live. We see God. We see the character, the image of the invisible God. But also, not only is that, he's also the firstborn of all creation. Again, in verse 15, it says he is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 
The firstborn in the Bible had the utmost importance in the family. They got the birthright. They got the blessing. They were the ones that, that, that everyone looked to, and they were the, the utmost important. And any family was the firstborn. Jesus is called the firstborn of creation because he is the most important figure in all of creation. There's no one more important than him. He is the utmost importance over everything. John 1.1 1, 1. says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him. Without anything made that was made, Romans 9, 5. It says, Whose are the fathers? And of whom are uh, and whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. Jesus is over all of creation. Colossians 2 9, 9 says this. It says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The God's fullness, God's power, God, everything that God has dwells in Christ. Hebrews 1 3. Says that who be in the brightness of his glory. Talking about God. Say Jesus isn't just one of God's greatest things. God, he is the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person and the upholding of all things by the word of his power. Do you understand it? Jesus, according to God, is the exact image of God. He has all of God's holiness, all of God's power, all of God's love. Everything that God is, is, is inside of Christ. And he didn't have the beginning at Bethlehem. You know, sometimes we look at Bethlehem and say, oh, that's when Jesus was born. That wasn't his beginning. That's just when he became flesh for mankind. That was his, that was his, his he, he, he never, he was there from the beginning. We see he's the firstborn of our creation. Thirdly, we see that he is the creator. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus wasn't just present at creation. You know, some religions teach that Jesus was one of God's first creations and he was there when God said, let there be light. He was there when God formed Adam. And he was there when God formed Eve. And he was there at creation. Jesus wasn't just there at creation. Jesus was the one doing the creating. When you read the Bible, and you get to Genesis, and you, you read where it says, and God said, that's Jesus. But the Bible says, let us make man in our own image. Not It wasn't God looking at Jesus, looking at his creation, saying, hey, Jesus, you're one of my creations. I'm going to make man to look like me. Jesus Christ was the one who said, I'm going to make man. I'm going to make the world. I'm going to speak everything out of nothing. We tend to see Jesus as some defenseless baby lying in a manger, especially around Christmas time. But the truth is, Jesus created the manger. Jesus created the town of Bethlehem. Jesus created the nation of Israel. Jesus created the continent of Eurasia that it sits on. Jesus created the world. Jesus created the universe. Jesus is the creator God. He created everything. But Paul doesn't just remind us that he created everything. He says all things were created by him and for him. You were not created for your own pursuits. You are created for God. You were created for your own pleasure. You are created by Jesus for him. God has a purpose for every single one of us. Your life isn't about you. Your life's about him. Amen. But not only do we see that Jesus is their creator, number four, we see he is in control. Look at verse 17. It says that he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That word consist means to hold together. He didn't just create this world. He sustains this world. He keeps everything going. You ever studied anatomy and figured out exactly what it takes to keep you alive? To keep your heart beating? To keep the oxygen from your lungs going to every part of your body? How, how many chemical reactions have to take place in a specific order at a specific time so you can live? God keeps it all together. The universe, you know, all the stars that are in the sky, and people are like, oh, well, you know, we got the sun, and we're the perfect distance, so the, the sun's gravity keeps us spinning. It's not the sun's gravity that keeps us in where we're supposed to be. It's God. He holds us together. He is in control. You know, Jesus made such incredible claims about his identity that if they're not true, 
that he's a lunatic that we need to forget about. He said that, he said in the Bible, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am the Father, we are one. He said, the words that I speak, they are given to me by the Father. He said, all things, everything that belongs to God, it also belongs to me. In John 15, 18, he says the Jews were trying to kill him because he was making himself equal with God. Because he is equal with God. When Thomas saw him after the resurrection and said, my Lord and my God, he didn't correct them. He didn't say, oh, Thomas, you overstepped your bounds there. I'm not God. He allowed himself to be worshipped as Lord and God because he is. Jesus is God in the flesh, and God has everything in control. Amen. You know, sometimes we think our lives are out of control. Things happen we don't understand. Unexpected things happen. We're like, God, man, I just, my, my life's out of control. And I don't understand what's going on. God says, I've got everything in control. There's nothing that takes him by surprise. We see, we were not only created by Jesus, but we're held together by him. The other thing we see that he is, in Colossians 18, we see that he is the head of the church. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This church, the church, now we talk about the church, we're not talking about New Horizon. It's talking about all the church, the, the body of Christ, believers. But let's, let's break it down. This church, this church doesn't belong to me. I started this church, you know, back in October 2011, but this isn't my church. It's God's church. God is the head of the church. It belongs to him. Why? Because, well, pastor, you started it. Yeah, but Jesus purchased it. He purchased it with his blood. And he goes, since I purchased this church, the church belongs to me. Again, the verse says that he is the firstborn from the dead. You know, he wasn't the first person in the Bible to come back from the grave. People in the Old Testament, they were raised from the dead. People in the New Testament, they were raised from the dead. Remember Lazarus? He came forth from the dead. Remember when Jesus resurrected? The Bible says that all sorts of graves were open, and people who had died, they came back from the dead. He wasn't the first one to rise from the dead, but he's the first one to rise from the dead who will never die again. You know, Lazarus, he died, he rose again. You know what happened to Lazarus? He died again. Everybody in the Old Testament, the race of the dead, you know what happened? They died again. You know, I heard one pastor said this, John Stott. He says, the healings that Jesus did when he brought someone back from the dead, they were not resurrections. They were resuscitations because they would all eventually die again. They just came back for a little bit and they had to die again. But Jesus, he's the firstborn from the dead because he rose from the dead and guess what? He's never going to die. Amen. He will never Die again. When he came out of his own grave by his own power, he had the credentials to take control of anything he wants. Christ's purpose and calling is supreme. He's the head of the church. He's from the beginning. He's the first person to conquer the grave. So that in everything the Bible says, he should have the preeminence or the supremacy. Jesus said, God says, I came from the grave. I rose from the dead. I'm the first one to be resurrected that will never die again. I rose from the dead so that in all things I shall have the preeminence. That includes my life. That includes my heart. Nothing should be higher in my life than Christ. He is the one Amen. who rose from the dead to have preeminence in my life. You know, it makes sense. He's the first place in the universe. He should have the first place in our hearts as well. We see he is the head of the church. Finally, we see that he is the fullness of God. Look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. This verse right here, it ties all the other verses together. When we see Jesus, we don't see a baby. We don't see a teacher. We don't see a good man. When we see Jesus... We see God. Amen. Every bit of God. We see his power. We see his grace. We see his love. We see his mercy. We see God. What does that mean for us when we learn who Jesus is according to the Bible? What that means is Jesus, he's my creator. He made me. He can remake me too. He created me. He can recreate me into his image and for me into the image of God. He, 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 he can hold all things together in our universe. That means he can help me hold all things together in my life. 
Our lives don't have to fall apart. Jesus is holding it together. He is superior in every kingdom, in every principality, that he can handle the problems that I may face today. He can handle the situations I will face when I go to work tomorrow. He is king of everything. He is supreme. He can take care of my, my problems I face every single day. If he's the creator and if he's in control, then I can rest in his plan and I can trust in his will. I can understand that, as he said in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for my good. That all things includes everything we face. The difficulties, the heartaches, the heartbreaks, the good times. I can trust that he has everything in control. If he is superior to, to demons, then, he's probably, then there's probably not anything in my life I'm going to face this week that he can't handle. He is powerful enough to take care of everything. And if he's the first one to rise from the dead, then I can rest assured if he's my Savior, I'll rise from the dead with him one day. If that's who Jesus is, then that's what he will be for you. That's what he will be for me. That's who he is. Jesus is everything that we need. But that leads us to one more last important question. Who do you say Jesus is? We can know what the Bible says. We can know what God says. We can say, man, I understand that God says he's all these things. And, man, I, I understand that what the Bible says. And it, that means nothing if Jesus isn't those things to you. So who is Jesus to you today? One day, we're all going to stand before God. And this question is the only thing that matters. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a good man? Is he a good example? Is he someone that he could emulate? Is he Lord of all your life? Is he in, in control of what you relinquish? Or is he just in control of what you relinquish control of? Is he your king? Is he your savior? Is he a redeemer? And hey, maybe you are saved. And I ask you this. Amen. Is who he is, is it affecting your life at all? Does it make a difference in your life at all? Who Jesus is. When I was in Bible college, we'd have... We had chapel every single day, and a couple times a week, we'd have guest speakers come in. And one Christmas, I think it was my second year up there, uh, a guest speaker came in December time, and I don't even remember his name. He was a, a pastor of a, of a church somewhere, and don't remember his name, don't remember where he's from or anything about him, but I remember his message. He preached about the Christmas story, and he came in and he said, you know, when you look at the Christmas story, we're faced with three different responses to Jesus. This, and they're all found in the story. And he began to talk about the innkeeper. He says, you know, the innkeeper, he's not mentioned in Scripture, but we know that there was no room for them in the end, so there had to be someone who the, Joseph went to and asked for room, and they said, we have no vacancies. And, you know, I'm sure Joseph pleaded his case and said, now, nah, you got to do something. My wife's, you know, she's nine months pregnant, and she's she's in labor, and then you, you got to do something, and you got to give us some room, anything. And there was some innkeeper who he didn't care. He didn't care about the plight of Mary and Joseph. He, he ignored Jesus completely. He said, then there's the wise men. And you look at the wise men, and they, they saw the star. They understood it meant something. And so they, they investigated. They explored to find out who this, who, what the star meant. And when they found that it meant the birth of a king, they went looking for this king. They, they wanted to investigate him. They wanted to explore who this king that was born to the Jews was. He was then you can look at Herod. And Herod was, a, was an evil man. He, he ended up killing his own son, killed thousands of children to try to, to, to try to get rid of Christ. He obviously had some health issues, some, some, some uh, different issues, and he tried to extinguish Jesus, tried to get rid of him completely. The wise men tried to explore him. Then he goes, you can look at the shepherds. And these people who no one else would go to, when they had the announcement by the angels that Jesus was born, they beat a path to the manger and they, they found him and they worshipped him. They worshipped him as God in the flesh. They worshipped him as the Savior. He says, you have the same choice in your life. You can make three choices as to what you're going to do with Jesus. If you're saved, you're lost. You can ignore him. You can ignore what he's doing in your life. You know, if you're not saved here, you can ignore the fact that he died for you. And he shed his blood. He paid a debt you owed and you couldn't pay. You can ignore that fact completely. Maybe you're like me and you're saved. You can still ignore.
ignore what Jesus does in your life. You can ignore him, try to convict you and draw you and change you. You can ignore his movement in your life. Because or you can explore him. You can try to investigate and learn about Jesus. It's good to learn about Jesus. We need to learn who he is and learn his character and learn these things. But some of us, we learn so much about Jesus, we never allow that knowledge to affect us. You know, the wise men, they finally found him. They gave him some gifts, gave him some gold, some frankincense, some myrrh. They, they gave gifts to him, but then they leave and that's all we know about him. Did his birth affect him in any other way than they had to take a long journey and give some gifts to a king? Did they come and realize who he was and accept him as him? Did it change their lives at all? It says you can ignore him, you can explore who he is, or you can be like the shepherds. You can worship him. You can allow his birth to drastically affect your life. The choice is yours. So I ask you today, who is Jesus to you this morning? Because that's what matters. And we all have to make that personal decision. No one can make it for you. If you're here this morning, you're not sure of your salvation. You say, Pastor, man, I, I know the story. You know, I'm an American. I, I've been in church my whole life. I've heard the story. I, I know the Christmas story, but I've never really accepted his gift of salvation. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't leave this church unsure. If you're not sure this morning, today is the day for you to accept Christ as your Savior and to answer that question. But maybe you're like me and you've been, you're saved, you've been saved for decades. Who is Jesus to you? We must make, this, we must make the decision to allow him to be who he is. To allow him to have the preeminence. To allow his life to affect ours. We've got to be like the shepherds. We've got to worship and adore the Savior and allow his birth to affect our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.